First of all, for my part, I would like to thank the uh, organising programme committee of the ECR for inviting me to uh, give this interactive session today, which I hope you all find informative and also enjoyable. The first case is uh, a 24-year-old lady, three months following a left-sided decompression discectomy at the L5-S1 level, who represents with left-sided sciatica. Just going to show you two slides. Here you can see uh, we have the sagittal T1-weighted uh, image. This is a T1-weighted post-intravenous gadolinium and the sagittal T2-weighted image. And just remember that the previous surgery was performed at the L5-S1 level on the left side. And here she is presenting it three months later with, again, a recurrence of left-sided sciatica. And the question is, the cause of this patient's symptoms is degenerative disc disease at the L5-S1 level, recurrent disc herniation at the L5-S1 level, epidural fibrosis at this level, infective discitis at this level, or it's unclear because gadolinium has been used. Please vote now. We have over 300 people are voting. Would you like to just complete your votes now? And have we got the results coming through? Okay, and that's excellent. Um, the answer, as you can see, and uh, identified by the majority uh, of people, is that this is a case of epidural fibrosis at the L5-S1 level. We'll just go through those images uh, again. And here one can identify that certainly surgery has been performed at the correct level because of that, of course, that's always an important point to uh, note. You can appreciate the enhancing soft tissue here posteriorly at uh, this uh, respective level. And on the axial images, here we have the T1-weighted study, and if one was just to look at that in isolation, it could be confusing about what is actually going on in the lateral recess here. However, when one administered intravenous gadolinium, note the beautiful soft tissue enhancement surrounding this left S1 nerve root, and also this enhancing scar tissue right back into the discectomy site. So this helps confirm the diagnosis of epidural fibrosis. Of course, if this was a recurrent disc herniation, one would not expect to get this uh, degree of enhancement. And also the other identifiers that we mentioned of infective discitis, again, one expects uh, that to retain uh, or to lose the definition of the end plates, which has not occurred in this case. So the take-home point from this case is that post-operative epidural fibrosis develops early and enhances with intravenous gadolinium. Moving on to case two, this is a case of a 66-year-old man who underwent a right-sided discectomy at the L4-L5 level, and two weeks post-surgery, he complained of recurrent right-sided sciatica. Here, one can see the sagittal T1-weighted study. Again, the sagittal T1-weighted study, but post-intravenous uh, gadolinium. And again, we can appreciate that the surgery was carried out at the L4, L5 level, the enhancing soft tissue here at the back. And this is the sagittal T2-weighted study. And these are axial images through the L4, L5 level. Again, the T1-weighted study, 
the T1-weighted post-contrast study and the T2-weighted study. MRI in this case reveals previous surgery at the wrong level, B, recurrent disc herniation, C, postoperative epidural fibrosis, D, epidural abscess, and E, overzealous use of hemostatic gel. For those of you who may not be familiar with hemostatic gel, this is a, a substance used by spinal surgeons to try and control small bleeders at the operation site. So if you please vote now. And the results are? OK, and that's, uh, that's very good. Here, the answer is it's recurrent disc herniation. Um, the majority of people got that, but I can see that there were a number of people querying about the possibility of uh, an epidural abscess. We'll just look at those uh, images again. Uh, as I think I probably gave the game away a tiny bit in the uh, initial presentation of the case, showing that this confirms the level at the L4, L5 level. Certainly, we have a lot of enhancement here, and we can also see it at the back, but really the sagittal images aren't ideal when one is trying to uh, get down to the fine detail in this sort of uh, scenario. There's certainly a suggestive, uh, suggestion of a disc herniation here on the T2-weighted study. But when then we go on and we look at the axials, this is really where uh, one gets down to the nitty gritty about uh, exactly what is the pathology here. And certainly we have an extradural uh, lesion, extradural pathology here, uh, compressing the right side of the thecal sac and just in the region of the exit point of that uh, L5 uh, nerve root. But what exactly is the nature of this material? And again, this is where the combination of the T1 and the T2 and also the post-contrast images are very helpful. If this was an epidural abscess, I think on T2 we would expect that the signal intensity of the material would be high signal, would be a fluid type of signal. And yes, certainly we might expect then also to get enhancement at the periphery of that, as perhaps is suggested on the T1-weighted post-contrast image. But of course, it's not quite the right signal to be uh, an epidural abscess on the T2-weighted study. So, so that's why it's not an epidural abscess. Also, I mentioned the use of hemostatic uh, gel. Again, that tends to be of a fluid type of signal. And again, the signal is wrong on the T2-weighted study. So this is a recurrent disc herniation. We have a, a, an extradural uh, lesion compressing the thecal sac. And we've got some enhancement following intravenous gadolinium along the periphery of that uh, disc. And this is due to some vascularized granulation tissue just at the uh, discal uh, periphery. And you can also appreciate as well the enhancing tissue along the uh, discectomy site. Other causes of potential epidural lesions in the postoperative spine, well, we've mentioned disc herniation, and of course that includes a, a sequestrated uh, disc. We've uh, also mentioned hemostatic gel. Epidural hematoma, again, something uh, worth thinking about, particularly if a patient is uh, representing with symptoms early, soon after uh, the operation. And then we've discussed epidural abscess, also facet joint, synovial uh, cyst, and of course epidural fibrosis we have already uh, seen an example of. And here this just shows you a couple of examples of an epidural abscess and what it might look like. This is the T1-weighted study, post-intravenous gadolinium, and note how you have that uh, enhancement at the periphery of that with the central non-enhancement. But in addition, we've got quite extensive paraversal soft tissue inflammation with uh, soft tissue enhancement, and we've got some further small paraversal abscesses uh, present as well. Certainly an, an epidural abscess can 
occur in isolation purely within the canal, but not infrequently it's also associated with other signs of uh, infection. And the facet joint cyst, here you can see in this example in another patient how we've clearly got uh, facet joint hypertrophy, some uh, hypertrophy of the ligamenta flava, and here on the T2-weighted sequence we've got this small cystic focus projecting into the spinal canal and being associated with, um, uh, for, from the patient's perspective, often excruciating sciatica. So in the post-operative spine, I think the take-home point is that there's several causes for an extradural lesion. It's not always uh, just uh, post-operative or epidural fibrosis. It's not always just a recurrent disc herniation. There are other potential causes, and to consider those in conjunction with the clinical uh, presentation. Just moving on to case number three. Uh, this patient underwent a left-sided L5-S1 discectomy with decompression of the S1 root, but the patient complained that they, she, they'd never been right since the operation and continued to complain of low back pain, but with uh, minimal leg pain. And after a period of about a year uh, with continuing symptoms, the patient underwent uh, an MRI with intravenous gadolinium. And here, uh, again, just if you recall, that symptoms were uh, that the previous surgery had been at the L5-S1 level. This is the T1-weighted study, the T1 post-intravenous contrast medium, uh, the T2-weighted study. And here you can see a series of axial images through the L5-S1 uh, level. I will point out, you can see in this example, again, this patient does have this abnormal tissue in the left lateral recess, uh, which enhances uh, around the left S1 nerve root. So this patient does have epidural fibrosis. But their main symptoms were, was that of low back pain, persisting low back pain, uh, rather than actual uh, sciatica. So again, if you just note and take particular observation of what's happening around the discal level with this patient. And the question here is that the MRI has shown evidence of A, type 1 modic signal change, B, type 2 modic signal change, C, type 3 modic signal change, D, fracture, and E, spinal infection. Please vote now. There's a fewer number of people voting this time. Okay, have we got the results coming through? Okay, so a bit of a, a scatter here. People uh, differentiating between type 1 and uh, type 2. And the answer here is type 1 modic signal change. So I think really this instance, this is uh, for perhaps um, uh, many of us really just a, a reflection on the different types of modic signal change. Um, and sometimes it can be a little bit difficult trying to remember which is which, but I think the type 1 modic signal change, if one thinks about that as being the inflammatory type of uh, appearance where you'll have the lowish signal on T1, but you'll have the high signal on T2, and also that it will enhance following intravenous uh, gadolinium. So this is a very typical appearance of the type 1 modic signal change that we've got here. With the type 2 modic signal change, that's where you have more the fatty type appearance, where it will be high signal on T1 and high signal on T2, and you probably won't appreciate much in the way of enhancement uh, following contrast medium. And then the type 3 modic signal change is that which we see with more a sclerotic type appearance, where it will be low signal on both T1 and also on T2. And of course, sometimes one can get a combination of these. You can have a mixture or a combination, perhaps, of type 1 and type 3, or um, uh, type 2 and 3. But this is type 1 modic signal change. And I put this in this particular case, really, to um, assist people not to get this confused with infection. Because, of course, this is a situation that sometimes one can think of the inflammatory type appearances, uh, the low signal on T1, the high on T2, and it enhances. 
uh, with contrast medium that this is spinal infection. Uh, and so this is something to be uh, aware of and to look for, if one's concerned about this, to look for other uh, features that might give weight to infection, such as loss of definition of the end plate, uh, paraversible soft tissue swelling, etc., none of which are present in this uh, example. This is the, uh, the patient. This, in fact, was their pre-operative study before they went on to have the uh, follow-up MRI a year later. And you can see this was the disc herniation for which they had the discectomy. But note in particular that there was little in the way of modic signal change at that time, whereas after a year following surgery as well, there was this development of modic signal change. And again, this is why sometimes it can be a, a confounding uh, feature for uh, people looking at these scans. But the development or progression of modic signal change can be a normal finding in the postoperative spine. This was actually another patient. You can see it just uh, came up last month, so I thought that I would put it in. Again, this is the T1-weighted study, uh, the T1 post-contrast medium, and the T2-weighted study. And this is a patient who'd had previous surgery, again, at the L4, L5 level. You can see the evidence of that uh, posteriorly. Uh, previous um, uh, discectomy at 4.5, and now a lot of modic signal change here. And this had been the appearance a year ago in April 2013. You can see, in incidentally, there was that large disc herniation that they had there extending into the foramen, uh, and relatively um, a small amount of modic change by comparison. So the take-home point for this case, really, is to be wary of end plate signal change in the postoperative spine to consider, well, is this infection or might it, in fact, just be a modic signal change? Just moving on to case four, this is a 48-year-old uh, person who underwent a pedicle screw fixation from L4 to S1 with uh, ALIF, and what this uh, stands for, for those of you who aren't familiar, is they had an anterior lumbar interbody fusion uh, at both of these levels as well, and this was performed using bone graft material. And you can see here the pedicle screw fixation and also uh, the bone graft at these levels. Three months following the operation, the patient complained of pain at the left side of the lumbosacral junction, which they said had been present since the operation, but was becoming slowly progressive. This is a T1-weighted midline uh, sagittal image, and these are both um, parasagittal left-sided images, again T1-weighted and a T1-weighted uh, with intravenous uh, gadolinium. And these are some axial images that have been taken through the L3, L4 level. And I think what you need to do really is to concentrate on the left side uh, at this level. But I will indicate to you that there is more than one pathology on, uh, on these slides. So just uh, looking again, concentrating around the uh, L3, L4 level and also looking elsewhere. The cause of this patient's symptoms then, for the question here is A, disc space infection at L4, L5, disc space infection at L3, L4, facet joint infection at L5, S1, infected disc and facet joint at L5, S1 and L3, L4 respectively, or E, infected disc and facet joint at L4, L5, and L3, L4, respectively. Please vote now. Answers coming through? Okay. That's very good. You can see there the answer is the infected disc at L5-S1 and the facet joint involvement at the L3-L4. That's, uh, that's very good. 
if we come back and just look, and we'll just concentrate on the left side and at the proximal uh, end, first of all. I think if we look here and looking at the L3, L4 level on the pre-contrast study, and then when we look on the post-contrast study, you can appreciate that really there's quite a lot of soft tissue enhancement taking place there. And also there's lots of definition of those facet joint margins if, say, you were to compare to what it looks like at the level below, where margins remain quite sharp. And I think you can appreciate on the axial images, if you look at the L3, L4 level here, a bit fuzzy around the facet joint. We give the contrast and a lot of uh, soft tissue enhancement there. And yes, on the T2-weighted study, it does look a little bit brighter, but I often think that the T2-weighted study uh, sometimes isn't quite so great in this uh, sort of scenario. And that's where, again, the use of contrast medium is so helpful. So having looked at the L3, L4 level, then uh, as many of you have also noticed that there's abnormality taking place down here at uh, S1. Here we can see when, in, on the parasagittal images, yes, you have the pedicle screw in situ there, um, and sometimes one can get a bit of partial uh, voluming going on, but I think you can appreciate that there certainly is a low signal there, which again is enhancing following intravenous gadolinium. Also, just note, kind of en passant, if you will, that we have had the previous interbody fusion here at 4-5, and again, these are normal sort of appearances. And again, at 5-1, uh, you can also uh, appreciate uh, that there. And again, just to show some further images of the midline uh, study, the T1-weighted study, the edema in the body of S1, uh, and then post-contrast medium, note how it enhances and again, on T2, I think, yes, you can appreciate the edema there, but it's not quite, doesn't quite hit the eye quite as readily as on the T1-weighted study. In this sort of scenario, it's also very helpful to uh, employ CT as an additional uh, imaging modality. And here I've put up a right uh, parasagittal, a left parasagittal, and the midline, really to uh, allow you compare the two and perhaps to flag up the uh, abnormality more readily. And you can see here on the right side the normal appearing uh, L3, L4 facet joint, and note how that compares with the left side with uh, quite marked destructive change in relation to that joint, which perhaps was not quite so readily appreciable on MR because, of course, all we see is the signal change and uh, the more edema-like appearances. And also uh, of note, again, when we look at S1, difficult to pick up an abnormality uh, on S1. Uh, if we come over here, yes, one may feel that one can see a little bit of sclerosis, but certainly we're not seeing any major destructive change in the way we see at the level of L3, L4. But this is really just a different stage in the infective process. And also just uh, note again on passant, the uh, um, incorporation of the bone graft at the L4, L5 level, of course, in this patient who had um, uh, this uh, interbody fusion. And if we note down at L5, S1, and we know that this was an anterior uh, approach because we can see some of the little uh, staples there used uh, for controlling uh, bleeders and what have you. Uh, and we can see that the bony incorporation is not quite as good as it is at the level above. And again, when we go on and look at some more of the CT images, again, you can note the destructive change in relation to this facet joint as compared to the appearance on the right side. So signs of post-operative spinal infection Bone marrow edema, of course, the earliest sign. One doesn't have to wait to see the destructive changes, although, of course, that uh, will um, take part uh, as part of the natural progression of uh, the infective process. And also, I think, to be aware of multi-level involvement. And, of course, sometimes that can uh, also be at some distance from the uh, operation site. So, again, I think just to keep that in mind. Uh, and, again, just the take-home point from that. Just moving on to case five, this was a patient who underwent a lumbar fusion two years ago, and they complained of recent recurrent back and leg symptoms. And this was the uh, plain radiographs on this uh, patient, 
Uh, here you can appreciate that, yes, they have clearly had the pedicle screw fixation and they have also had an interbody fusion uh, present as well. And so really this is just a case for just taking a close eye at the, uh, the metalwork in this case. So this is a patient who had a previous lumbar fusion about two years ago and uh, they are getting some progressive uh, symptoms. So what is the diagnosis here? A, the screws are loose. B, the screws are wrongly placed. C, the screws have fractured. D, the L4, L5 interbody cage is wrongly placed. Or E, vertebral body fracture. Please vote now. One of the things I think when uh, patients have uh, screws in situ is that these are the three things that if they suddenly develop with new symptoms, you need to think, well, is there something wrong with the metalwork? And you need to ask yourself and specifically look at the screws. Again, the main ones being, are they fractured? Are they in the right place? Have they started to become loose? Have they started backing out? And then, of course, when you've got additional metalwork in situ, if you've got some markers related to an interbody cage or other interbody fusion device, again, to look at those. And then, of course, sometimes with time, the bone can just generally become weak, and we also have to think about the possibility of fracture. So here we've got really a, a selection of uh, different um, uh, answers here, and the answer is that the screws are loose. So if we look at these images in a bit more uh, detail, I think just looking on the plain radiograph, I think if we look at the screws, yes, one or two of them are perhaps not, they're not completely symmetrical as regards their location. But when, we're, when we ask the question, are they wrongly placed, we're really asking the question, are they uh, broaching on the uh, spinal canal? Uh, are they protruding into the foramen? Are they in a location that they can give rise to nerve root irritation? Um, so we need to look at, at uh, it from that perspective. Um, and then we need to ask ourselves, what, are the screws loose? Now, sometimes I think on plain radiographs, it can be quite uh, difficult. I think here in this instance, one might ask the question here, have we got an area of loosening uh, and loosen C uh, around uh, the screws here? Um, and other things we might look at is the interbody cage. Does that look okay? And yes, I think that that looks okay in this instance. But yes, overall, the uh, strong suspicion on the radiograph would be that these screws are loose. And really, although you might not think it, but CT can uh, provide excellent definition as regards the metalwork. And here we can see in this example, here you can appreciate the screw uh, and here we've got an area of loosened C surrounding it, and we have uh, some loosening of the screw. And similarly here on uh, this side as well. Again, you can appreciate nicely in this example that the screws are all well placed, satisfactorily placed, and also note the other uh, appearance. This is the interbody fusion, and we're starting to see some consolidating bone uh, across the uh, site here as well. And again, when we look on the axial images, again, nice location of uh, uh, screws more proximally, but here you can appreciate the loosened C surrounding the uh, screws uh, on both sides. And again, similarly, one can go on and do reconstructions, and reconstructions are also very nice because uh, you can also see, if you're interested in looking at the actual spinal canal and the location of screws relative to the canal, it can be very helpful from that perspective. And again, you can see the loosened C around here, and also notes the normal appearance here of this consolidating bone uh, across the um, uh, interbody graft. So really the take-home point here is that CT is the best imaging modality for evaluation of bony fusion and also to assess the metalwork. Just moving on to case six, and this is a case of a patient who had a spinal stenosis decompression at the level of L4, L5, and who went on to complain of headache. This is the T1-weighted study, the T2-weighted study, and this is a T1-weighted study following intravenous gadolinium. 
and these are the axial images in this same patient. And this is just a sagittal stir sequence here as well. So the cause of this patient's symptoms is A, a soft tissue abscess, B, postoperative seroma, C, exuberant use of Adcon L gel or hemostatic gel that we've referred to earlier, a CSF leak, or a hematoma. Please vote now. very small number of people voting. Sorry? Oh, shame. Does, um, um, maybe the technician, could you just feed that through that the voting system isn't working? Okay, well, while we're seeing if they can adjust it, I'll just, um, oh, well, we're starting to work now, okay. Great, I, I thought that last case, it couldn't have been that hard uh, that nobody was voting. Okay, that's terrific. Have we got the results coming through, please? Okay, that's marvelous. This, uh, this was a very interesting case. Um, the, the majority of you have uh, got that uh, correct. A CSF leak, it, it really, this is the largest CSF leak uh, that I think any of us um, uh, in our department had seen. And this was a uh, patient, as you can see, who had had a headache. And I think that when the surgeon first saw these images before the report came through, he had been asking us if we'd aspirate uh, this uh, collection. And of course, I don't think the patient would have felt too great if we had uh, gone ahead and done uh, that. Um, so this is a, a CSF leak and really a, a gross example of uh, same and not to be confused with any of the other collections that uh, you saw in the uh, list. It would be extremely unusual for a post-operative seroma to um, uh, be this big. And usually post-operative seromas, of course, are much more superficial. Whereas you can see on these images that the fluid signal is emanating actually from the spinal canal and tracking right through, right along the operation site through into the subcutaneous fat. Following intravenous gadolinium, no significant uh, peripheral enhancement. I think if this was an abscess, the patient would be extremely uh, ill. And, of course, with a hematoma, normally one would get layering out of uh, different products. As you can see in this particular example, this is a patient with uh, a smaller uh, post-operative fluid collection, and you can appreciate the fluid fluid levels that are a typical uh, feature with uh, that. Uh, and of course, the method of treatment for the CSF leak, of course, is that the surgeon has to go back in and uh, repair that. So really, the take-home point there is just to be wary of fluid collections. They're not all post-operative uh, seromata. They're not all related to infection. So this uh, next case is that of a 74-year-old female with a nine-week history of left radicular pain following pedicle screw fixation at the L3, L5 level. So, of course, again, going back when we get these symptoms occurring early or relatively early in the post-operative phase, uh, one will be very concerned that it is uh, related directly to the operation itself. Now, this particular patient had also some years ago in the past had a fusion at the L5-S1 level, and you can see that that's a very solid fusion uh, that uh, this patient has. But they have now had recent, relatively recent, pedicle screw fixation from L3 to L5. And as I mentioned uh, to you earlier, that when we've got screws in situ, to ask the question, are these screws loose? Might they have fractured? Um, uh, or um, are they uh, perhaps misplaced or along those lines? So the question here is, what is the cause of this patient's symptoms? Is it malposition of the left L3 screw? 
malposition of the left L4 screw, malposition of the left L5 screw, D, is it a fractured screw, or E, is the metalwork loose? And I'll just show you that uh, example just once again. So it's really a question of which level is uh, the screw potentially malplaced. If you just vote now, please. And if we could have the answers, please. Okay, a selection of uh, answers there. The correct answer is malposition of the left L5 screw. If we just go back and really try to interrogate the plain films before we go on to any further um, uh, imaging, I've mentioned that it is the left side, so there was no choice as regards the right. And I think you can appreciate, we've got the pedicles here, we've got the uh, pedicles here. One could ask the question, is that uh, screw malplaced? Is it a bit medialized? But there wasn't an option for the right. Um, and here, I think this one looks nicely placed. But here, if we uh, look um, here at the L5 level, this is really looking very uh, medialized. So when we go on, this is the appearance on CT, because as again, as I said, CT is the best modality for uh, looking at and evaluating the metalwork. And here's screws well positioned at uh, this level. But when we come down to the level of L5, note this is the, that left screw cutting right across the uh, left lateral recess. And remember, as I mentioned, that this patient had also had a previous fusion many years ago at the L5-S1 level, so that accounts for the appearances that you're seeing out here. Now, on the slice below on this patient, again, this is at the level of L5, there was this tiny little, this is a little bone fragment. And of course, when the uh, surgeon goes into, uh, is, you know, putting the screws in. Sometimes there can be a little bit of dust. There may be a little bit of fragmentation. And again, particularly in a scenario where a patient may have had previous surgery there, there might be a little bit of osteophytic new bone around. Uh, again, these are other issues. And again, CT is the best modality for detecting that. And here you can appreciate on the uh, reconstruction, you've got that uh, screw uh, perhaps difficult on the surgical reconstruction to actually appreciate its slight medialization. But again, you can beautifully appreciate that small bone fragment, and it's just sitting over the uh, foramen and prime for giving rise to some nerve root irritation. And again, you can just see those uh, beside each other on the uh, images adjacent. So this patient went on and had all of the left-sided screws removed with immediate relief of uh, symptoms, because again, remember what they'd actually presented with was um, uh, the sciatic type pain, but it was complete uh, relief of symptoms. Uh, and again, you can see there that that was the site of the old screw track just directly across the lateral recess. So again, take home point, nerve root symptoms post-op. If a patient has had screws uh, inserted, again, think of those as a potential cause for uh, their symptoms. Just moving on to case number eight, a 61-year-old male who underwent a posterior instrumented fusion for degenerative lumbar scoliosis, and he also had a TLIF. Also, uh, this is a transforaminal lumbar interbody cage at the L4, L5 level. And at three months post-op, he had worse neurology. So here you can see these are just the plain radiographs in this patient. This is all I'm going to show you at this stage. So he had extensive pedicle screw uh, fixation. Um, and he's also had an interbody cage placed at the L4, L5 level. And he's got worse neurology now than what he had three months uh, ago at the time of surgery. So I'm asking you to um, tell me the one concerning feature shown. 
A, failed fusion. B, loosening of the screws. C, metal fatigue fracture. D, vertebral instability at the level above. Or E, displacement of the interbody cage. Please vote now. OK, and if we can see the answers, please. OK, that's excellent. We didn't have as many people voting this time as before, but that is indeed the answer. Displacement of the interbody cage. Now, we had a, a number of uh, other answers there. You must remember, again, it's important to incorporate the, with the clinical symptoms, uh, and uh, this was at three months, and really had no... It is, neurology was worse than it had been. So I think if we go back and we look at the pedicle screws, there's certainly no evidence of any fracture, no obvious evidence of loosening, although it's possible we might want to go on and uh, do CT to look at this further. But we also have some other metalwork in situ, and what we've got is this interbody cage. And if we just blow up and look at a magnified image of this, here we've got the markers related to the cage. There's one, there's the other, and there's the other. And so what's happened is that the interbody cage has been displaced and it's displaced backwards and into the spinal canal. And this is what's accounting for the worsening of the pathology or neurology. If we look here on the T1-weighted image, uh, and again, here we've got certainly some artifact related to the pedicle screw fixation, but L4, L5, this is the level of the interbody cage. You can just uh, make out aspects of the cage there. And also here, and it's backed right into the spinal canal. Here we're coming out to the parasagittal image. Um, and again, this is on the axial T2-weighted image. And this uh, cage right here within the left side of the canal. Also nicely demonstrated on the CT images. There you can appreciate uh, the markers uh, displaced posteriorly into the canal. And again, on the axial study that this is on the bone window and on the soft tissue window, and again, appreciable on the coronal reconstruction. Again, the coronal reconstruction is very good for looking at the contents of the canal. So the take-home point from this is that in the presence of an interbody cage, look for the radioopaque markers and check the location and that they are located satisfactorily. And you may need to liaise and chat with your spinal surgeons to ask what they actually use uh, for an interbody cage because, of course, there are a number of them available on the market. And as we all know, uh, most of our surgical colleagues will have particular preferences for uh, certain types of um, uh, equipment. And just moving on to what will probably be the last case, um, will be case number nine, which is a 40-year-old female who's undergone a successful fusion procedure from L4 to S1, but during the past year, she's been complaining of progressive low back pain. And these are the plain radiographs on this uh, lady. You can see from uh, referring back to what we've looked at earlier in the talk, she's had previous pedicle screw fixation. We can see she's also had an interbody fusion here, probably from an anterior approach. We know that because we've got the small uh, metallic sutures there. And she's had bone graft used uh, in here. So she's got progressive low back pain over the past year. So what is the likely cause of her new symptoms? Is it A, infection? B, screw loosening, C, degenerative change at the level above, D, malalignment, or E, vertebral fracture. And I'll just show you those very briefly again. So please vote now. And the results coming through. Oh, variety of uh, responses there. Um, so the correct answer is degenerative change at the level above. If we go back and look at the uh, radiographs, 
you can see that really the fusion looks as if it is taking place well, it looks as if uh, it is uh, fusing up nicely. If we look at the screws, there's no obvious evidence of malalignment. I appreciate that that screw is perhaps directed a little bit inferiorly, but it's not really uh, medialized. And I don't see any evidence of spinal infection there. The vertebral end plates remain sharply defined. Of course, as we've spoken previously, early signs of spinal infection can be bone marrow edema. Um, but I wouldn't be that unkind as to show you bone marrow edema, uh, just expecting you to come up with it on the plain film. But I think what we can see on this is that at this L3, L4 level, we've lost some disc height, we've got evidence of degenerative disc disease. And of course, following a fusion procedure, the development or acceleration of degenerative changes either above or below uh, can uh, be a cause of symptoms some way further down the line. This was the patient's MRI examination, which shows clearly fusion uh, nicely at the 4.5 and L5-S1 levels, but they have got degenerative uh, signs here at the immediate level above. This patient went on to have this uh, fused, um, and here it, they've had an interbody uh, cage inserted. These are just the post-operative images. And I've just put this case in really just to show you the spectrum of change in the development of um, uh, fusion uh, in the spine. And you can see this patient is clearly solidly fused at 4.5, and 5.1, but at L3, L4, again, they have a, an interbody cage which acts as a framework for the development of uh, bony bridging and uh, further consolidation. And you can see on the axial images, again, this is where bone graft has been used, and this is the framework of the cage with some uh, graft, but also allowing the development of um, uh, healing and fusion. And for the development of symptoms related to degeneration or instability can take place either anteriorly or posteriorly related to the disc or posteriorly related to the facet joint, uh, as seen in another patient here, uh, where they've developed disc herniation, also facet joint arthrosis, facet joint uh, effusions, and this can be a cause of symptoms further down the line. So the take-home point here is that adjacent level instability, either above or below the level of fusion, can be a cause of symptoms months or years post-surgery. So I'm going to uh, finish my talk uh, there. I have tried to address a number of uh, issues related to the post-operative uh, spine, um, including some findings that would be expected as part of the post-operative process and also findings that perhaps are not expected and are a cause of pathology and which need to be addressed. Thank you very much. <laughs>